I really wanted to meet somebody and so I really wanted a girlfriend and I thought I would just really be happy if somebody liked me and then when uh, Dorks and I got together and we started seeing each other and getting serious then I was just thinking I just really want to be married I would just be happy you know once we're married I'm going to be happy then after we were married I got to focusing on this challenge I had received about uh, sharing the gospel with a group of people in, a, in, a, in an Indian tribe somewhere out in the jungle somewhere who had never heard it before and I just became really really focused on that and so all of my mental energy was geared at getting our student loan paid off so that we could enter the new tribes mission training that was my goal I would just be happy if we could do that but no sooner did we get into the training then I began to to think well I just want to get out of this training so that we can move forward and so that we can actually go to this place where where the Lord wants us to be and so then we we moved to Columbia South America and then I started learning Spanish and I was really intensely focused on learning Spanish and I think well once I learn Spanish then we'll really be free then we'll be able to actually go and to and to move in with a tribal group and begin learning their language and then that's when I'll really be happy but then uh, we moved in with the tribal group and I was focused on learning that language and so intensely so that at times I walked over people in the process in this quest of just wanting to become fluent in this language to live in their world to be able to understand what they were saying and to be able to talk with them and through the years in dealing with paperwork in South America which can be a real adventure <laughs> whether it's a renewing your visa or even just renewing your car registration sometimes that would be a day-long process and if you got there at five in the morning with your car and you left with your registration at three o'clock I mean that was three o'clock in the afternoon I mean this was this was a, a, a cause for a party and celebration we felt like going out and getting steak and, and I used to think I would just be happy if I didn't have to mess with this crazy paperwork my life would just be perfect if I didn't have to deal with that and then through later years thinking I would just be happy if we didn't have to move around so much if there weren't so many roadblocks and tension in the country and so on and so on and this week it occurred to me once again that probably one of the greatest regrets that I have in my personal life is that I have spent so much of my life stressing about something that I wanted to be different or anticipating something that I wanted to happen in the future. And I realized that setting goals and having a healthy motivation to get things done and to achieve them, that, that's a good thing. That drives us, that moves us on, and, and I think you can even find a scriptural basis uh, for some of that as well. But one problem with goal setters and, and forward thinkers and high achievers is that, is that sometimes you can become so focused on what's coming in the future that you forget to live in the present and enjoy where you're at right now and uh, you can become so intent on the future that, that you that you forget to live in the present instead of being thankful and content for the house that you live in all you can think about are all the remodeling projects that need to be done instead of being content with the peanut butter and jelly sandwich that you're eating you're wishing you had a pork chop or a steak to sink your teeth into instead of being content with the salary you have you're always thinking about oh what I could do if I just had a little bit more money instead of seeing the donut you only see the hole and where this can really get poisonous is in relationships and especially in, in marriage for example because instead of being grateful and content and thankful for the good qualities that your partner has and, and believe it or not they do have some 
You only see the things that you wish that you could change. You see the, the things that irritate you and you think, I could just be happy if they would just change this or change that. And so it goes in every area of life. And in our failure to be content, we forget to be thankful and we lose the joy that God wants us to have for today. Through living in this time, being in this station of life, living with that partner or that relationship or that circumstance, whatever it is that God in his sovereignty and wisdom where he has allowed us to be. Instead of saying, this is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Our eyes are always on tomorrow, always anticipating something else that we want to happen. Whether it's waiting for the pandemic to end, or waiting till your kids are out of college, or getting your mortgage paid, or, or whatever it is that you think will finally allow you to be happy. Thanksgiving Day is this Thursday. And, of course, this is a Thanksgiving message, and a lot of us are going to gather around our turkey dinners on Thursday, and, and, and if you're like us, sometimes we have this custom where we'll go around the table and we'll all say something that we're thankful for before we, you know, plow into the turkey and dressing and mashed potatoes and all that good stuff. But I find it highly ironic that the day after Thanksgiving Day is what? is Black Friday. <laughs> and very often all those thankful thoughts and that little spirit of thankfulness that we have on Thanksgiving Day gets washed away like a sandcastle at the beach in this ocean of tension and stress and materialistic greed that goes with that. And I'm sure very often thankfulness is something that we just really give lip service to because we never really learned the secret of what it means to be content with what we have, with where God has us, and with what God has given us. And while the Apostle Paul was in prison at Rome, he received uh, a monetary gift from a group of people at the church at Philippi. And in this thank you letter that he was writing to them, which is known as the book of Philippians, if you want to turn there, in chapter 4, he, he, he gives them thanks for this gift that they had sent, but then he, he, he adds some very powerful words as he says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. See. He learned in whatever situation he had to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And those words that are so quoted, are so often quoted by all of us and that I've heard quoted, you know, even on TV shows and they've been quoted by people all over the world, sometimes Christians and sometimes non-Christians, even it's very interesting that that the context in which he says that is in this thing about learning to be content that's what we're going to talk about here this morning but let's go to the lord in a word of prayer here as we begin father this morning we do want to give you the glory and lord as we think about those lord just the wonderful truth in that song that with his blood he has saved me. With his power he has raised me. Lord, we have just so much reason to be the most grateful, contented, most thankful people on earth. And Father, I pray as we look at this matter of being content, that uh, Lord, your Holy Spirit will open our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would receive all the glory from everything that's said and done here. Lord, I pray that, that my mind and my words will be used by you in such a way that, Lord, to encourage people, Lord, to challenge people, to challenge myself, Father, and help us grow in this area. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in English nowadays, the word content, as we think about, first of all, what does it mean to be content? 
Um, the word content in English nowadays is, is an adjective. It's, it's a word that describes, you know, he, he is content. But actually where Paul is using it here in, as he's writing to the Philippians, he's using it as a verb. It's a verb here in the language, and, 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 it's this, and, and, and the idea is, is, is to content yourself. What Paul is literally saying is, he says, I have learned to content myself. That's what he says here. And sometimes, though it's kind of gone a little bit out of vogue in the English language, sometimes you will still hear, still hear somebody say something, well, I'm going to content myself with that. Uh, for example, one example in a dictionary is, I wanted to take two weeks vacation, but I had to content myself with one because the office was so busy. And very often the idea that we have with being content it's the idea of, oh, well, well, I didn't really get what I wanted, but I guess I'll just have to settle for it. You know, it's this idea of settling for something that is second best. But, you know, that, that is not what the word content means in the Bible at all. It is actually something much, much stronger. Because in, in, in the Bible, this word to be content actually means to be, and I'm quoting from Thayer's lexicon here, it says, to be possessed of unfailing strength. To be possessed of unfailing strength, to be strong, to suffice, to be enough. And the idea of being content is not settling for something that is second best, but is being so strong and sufficient in what you have that you don't need to think about needing something else. That's the idea of being content. And it's found uh, several places in the New Testament. Uh, for example, when uh, Jesus was telling the disciples to go and to feed this group of 5,000 plus people that had gathered there uh, to hear him teach, uh, Philip answers them and he says, and he uses this word in the negative when he says, when he says, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough. Same word. Would not be enough for each of them to get a little. And Philip must have liked this word because he uses it again in John 14 where he says to Jesus, show us the Father and it will be enough. Show us the Father and it is enough for us. Lord, that's all we want, Jesus. Just show us the Father. Let us see him and then we'll be content. Then we'll have enough. In Hebrews 13.5, we see that this idea of being content is not just an attractive option for us, but it's actually a command from God. As the author says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do? do to me and what he's telling us here is to be content and in, in saying be content with what you have the Lord is saying let what you have be enough let it be sufficient let it be strong in what you have and so that you're not spending your mental energy stressing about what you don't have or about what you wish you had or wishing that things were different and on just a purely practical level and this is something that I, I would tell my kids over and over, I remember, as, as they were growing up, is that life is just so much happier if you have your eyes on what you have instead of what you don't have. Just start looking around at what you have. And then you realize, man, I, I have got a lot. I've got a lot of good things here. And so it really doesn't make any sense for me to be pining away about something that I think is going to make me happier. So that's what it means to be content. But then the next question is, when are we supposed to be content? The focus here in Hebrews 13.5 is in regards to money. As he says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. And of course, um, when in speaking about keeping your life being free from the love of money, that also means being free from the love of the stuff that money can buy. You know, you may not feel like you have a love of money, but maybe you have a love of shoes. And so shoes is where all your money goes. And in answer to a question I was reading, uh, this online questionnaire, 
With the question, how often do you buy new shoes? One person answered, when I was younger, I used to go crazy buying a new pair of sneakers almost every other week. Or buy new shoes every other week. That, that's really something. When one person was asked, how often do you buy a new gun? <laughs> Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> Deer season, yeah, I know. Um, one man replied, I need to stop. I've purchased two new guns and three used guns and a file cabinet full of ammo so far this year. I bought another one today and I vowed to save for the rest of the month, honest. Well, after the gun show this weekend, then I stop. I'll promise. And the love of money can be the love of cars, it can be the love of clothes, it can be the love of accessories, or the love of books, or fishing gear, or social outings, or sporting events, or whatever it is that you spend your money on. Love of money is all about the love of stuff, and having the stuff that money can buy. Now, is it wrong to have stuff, and is it wrong to have money? Of course not. In fact, it's not even wrong to be wealthy and to have a lot of it because uh, the Apostle Paul, as he was writing to Timothy, he said this, he said, he said, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And so it's not wrong to be rich. Paul doesn't, t that doesn't tell Timothy, say to these rich people, stop being rich, give everything away. He doesn't say that. But what he says is, he says, don't put your hope in your riches. Don't put your trust in your riches. But then he goes on to say that they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And so the question is, is not whether or not you're rich. It's whether or not you're rich in good works. It's not a question of how much you actually have, but how much do you share what you really have? And here, here's just a really good question for us to consider. Do you spend more of your money on stuff that you really don't need than you spend for helping people who really are in need? Do you spend more time and more stuff hoarding up things on the earth than you spend on the Lord's work so that you can lay up treasure in heaven. If God's given you an abundance, then by all means enjoy the abundance that God's given. He, it says he gives us freely all things to enjoy and he wants you to enjoy it. But just remember that Jesus said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if you are spending more on hoarding up stuff here on this earth than you are spending for helping people get into heaven, well, it just shows where your heart really is, is what Jesus is saying. And it all comes back to this matter of being content. How much money is enough money? How much stuff is enough stuff? You know, there's no checklist, there's no bar graph, there's no list of, of, of things there given in Scripture. We're not talking about something legalistic here. We're, we live under grace. But it may surprise you to know that the Word of God actually does give us a measurement for how much we are supposed to need in order to be content. Because you know what Paul said to Timothy? He wrote to him and he said, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Hey, Brandon, my slide's not... There we go. Okay. He says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But get this. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And then he goes on to say in a similar vein to what we've just read in Hebrews and warns people about the love of money and the desire to be rich and how that can pull you away and, and cause all kinds of sorrows. But as far as how much and when we should be content, this is God's answer. I didn't write this. This is what God says. If you have food to eat and you have clothing to wear, then be content with that. But being content also applies to 
other areas that may have nothing to do with money and stuff. Because look at the last of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20:17, where the Lord says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. You know, coveting something means to want something that somebody else has. And of course, coveting then would be the polar opposite of being content. And sometimes people don't just cover, sometimes people don't just covet things. They can covet people. And I mean, you just think about it. How many songs have you heard, which is a song about somebody wanting somebody else's man or wanting somebody else's woman? I remember when I was in high school, we used to, they had a jukebox there at the, in the cafeteria. And I remember every day at lunch, somebody would play this ignorant song, I Wish That I Had Jesse's Girl. Anybody remember that? <laughs> All the time, every day. And a little bit newer one I heard more recently is somebody else singing about wanting to, and I'm quoting, uh, to, wanting to take someone else's holiday, sometimes the grass is greener, sometimes someone else's sugar is sweeter as he is making plans for um, seducing somebody else's girlfriend or somebody else's wife. And the fact is, you can find yourself coveting just about anything. You can covet somebody's good looks, you can covet somebody's personality, you can covet their talent. You can covet their, their way of getting along with people or their popularity, but the fact is, is that it's all wrong. And in the New Testament, God speaks very strongly about it in Colossians 3, 5, where he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry if you're not content with the things that God's given you if you're not content with the partner that God has given you to you for life if you're not content with your gifts and abilities with the face or the shape or the body that God has given to you your personality what that really means is, is that you're not content with God you have made an idol out of whatever it is that you think that God has held out on you and that you're longing after. And the command to be content and learning to be content is one of the greatest safeguards against adultery, against the love of money, and against getting sucked into this materialistic greed or any other kind of greed that just flows through our veins here in this world. And that's because if you are strong and secure in what you have, then you're not going to be concerned about something that somebody else has. So then how do we become content? What's this secret that Paul is talking about when he said he had learned the secret of being able to be content in whatever circumstances in which he found himself? When he said, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And which is the same thing, once again, that we saw in Hebrews 13, where the Lord said, be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And the secret to being content is simply that the bigger space the Lord has in your heart, the more space that he occupies in your heart, the greater your contentment is going to be. The measure of our contentment is always going to be found in the quality of our relationship with the Lord. Let me say that again. The measure of our contentment is always going to be found in the quality of our relationship with the Lord. It's interesting that as we're talking about being content or not being content, that this is really the thing that pulled us away from the Lord in the first place. You go back in the book of Genesis and you read the account of creation when God created the first people. And, and God had given them this perfect world to live in. 
He had given them everything they could possibly want to eat. He had made them lords and rulers over it all, have dominion over to have dominion over everything. This is yours to manage. It was like God was setting Adam up as, as like a co-regent there in the Garden of Eden. And he gives him a perfect woman to live with. I mean, think about it. Eve was a perfect woman. God took her out of Adam's rib, and he made a helper fit for him. And Eve was the perfect wife, and Adam was the perfect husband. He was the perfect man. They had a perfect world. But then what happened? <laughs> then the enemy came along, and he told them that what they had wasn't enough. Hey, what about that tree over there? Isn't God holding out on you? Ah, he's keeping the good stuff for himself. He knows if you have that, then you'll be like he is. He doesn't want you to have it. You know, the sad story that when Adam and Eve took the fruit, that as they listened to that voice and believed that old lie that God is holding out on you and that you don't have enough and that you need to take something that God hasn't given you, the man, I tell you, that same old nature has just been flowing through our veins ever since then. If you don't believe me, just look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Look in your own heart and ask yourselves. Look at the times you've been jealous of something that somebody else had. Look at the times that you found yourself wishing that you were different, wishing that something was different so that you could just be happy. Look at your own kids. <laughs> I have three wonderful children who, uh, who have grown up and are serving the Lord, and I, and I just praise the Lord for each one of them. They're wonderful people. But you know what? When they were little, I never had to teach any of them how to tell a lie. I never had to teach any of them how to be selfish. I never had to teach any of them how to reach out and to take something that belonged to their brother or sister or to whack them over the head if they didn't get it. I didn't have to teach them any of that. You know why? Because I'm their daddy. And nobody ever had to teach me how to tell a lie. Nobody ever had to teach me how to be jealous and to want something that somebody had or to punch them in the mouth or, or all these other things that I just grew up doing because it's hardwired into us. It's part of our nature. And the Lord gives us a description of ourselves here in the book of Ephesians. And he says, and you were dead and trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air just like Adam and Eve did the spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived every one of us in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind and I've shared this with guys at the jail that whether you're a prisoner or whether you're a preacher, whether you're the governor or the garbage collector or whoever you are, this is all of us. This is where we all start out. Rebelling against God, running the other way, wanting stuff that God hasn't given us, being jealous, being selfish, you know, being bitter, you know, hurting other people, trying to get our own way, a bunch of lawbreakers, who, who really don't deserve anything other than God, other, any, don't deserve anything from God except to be punished. And deserving his wrath, just like the rest of everybody else on the earth, the rest of mankind. But then Paul gives us the good news. As he says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And my friend, if you don't have a relationship with God, this is how you have one. It's given to you by him, by grace. It's a free gift through what Jesus did on the cross. God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die in your place. 
to take the punishment for all the wrong that you've done, all the stuff that's, that's messed up inside your brain. Jesus died for all of that and because of all of that for each one of us. And then God raised him from the dead. And because he raised him from the dead, he offers you forgiveness and a brand new life together with him. And if you want him to take your sin away, if you want him to make you a new person, then he will do that. Just by your putting your faith, your trust in what he did for you when he sent his son to the earth, allowed him to die on the cross and raised him from the dead. And when you do that, then he can begin making you into the person that he created you to be. And so as we're talking about being content, about being strong and secure in what you have so that you really don't need anything else. Just think for a minute about what we've just read here, just in this one passage of scripture that is here on the screen. What do we have here? Well, we have a merciful God who loves us and who doesn't just love us, but he loves us with a great love. A great love. A love that never gets tired. Never gets bored with us. Never wishes that we would just go somewhere else and leave him alone. God loves us with a great love. We have status as a child of the king. You know, Paul talks about in the book of Romans how that we're co-heirs with Christ. That everything Jesus is going to receive, we're going to get a part of. And, 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 and as you know the Father, and it says this, he's going to continue to show his immeasurable riches of his kindness and grace on into eternity. And folks, what we're experiencing now in knowing Jesus and having him calm our hearts and being able to go to him in prayer and to give thanks to him, folks, this is just scratching the surface to what we're going to continue to experience throughout eternity. God is infinite and he is going to continue on showing us his great love throughout all of eternity. And it's never going to get old and we're never going to get tired of it because there's always going to be something new. And as we see this, then it begins to make sense. As Paul understood this and what he had in Christ as to why he was able to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And one place that really, where he really sheds light on, on what he means by this is over in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, when he speaks about this thing that he called his thorn in the flesh. As he asked God to take it away and how the, the God answered him when he did. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And uh, this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, we don't know exactly what it was, but it was not something that Paul liked, obviously. It was something that caused him a lot of grief. In fact, he asked the Lord three times to take it away. But what did God say to him? What the Lord said to him was that what he had was enough. It's sufficient. What you have is enough because the very thing that Paul was wishing that God would take away was the means by which God was pouring his never-ending strength into him. Through that very thing that was making him uncomfortable. You see, not only has God given us everlasting life, he's also giving us never-ending strength to be content in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves. And once again, it makes perfect sense then in Philippians when Paul says that he has learned the secret of being content in whatever circumstances, as he said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And, uh, this week, I was reading about a, a couple 
uh, called Ian and Larissa Murphy. And they met in college back in 2005 and they fell in love and were making plans to get married. But then uh, a, a year later, when he was on his way to work, where he was working, making money so that he could buy a ring so that they could get married, Ian was in a car accident, lost control of the vehicle, yeah, went underneath a, a SUV, I believe, and left him with a, a brain injury and a crushed knee and several other uh, traumatic types of, inter of injuries that he had. And uh, after uh, Larissa joined his parents and they went through this long process of rehabilitation and hospitals and surgeries and all that, and then he began to regain some of his ability to to walk and to talk. And as she did this, and as they worked through this, they realized that their love was still growing, and so they made the decision to get married. And they did get married on August 28, 2010. And in speaking about being content in whatever the circumstances, uh, Larissa was writing on John Piper's uh, blog about desiring God and, and, and talking about what it means to be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Larissa said, recently this has meant believing I can do all things when I'm woken up by the sound of Ian throwing up at 4 a.m. He can't move his body fast enough not to choke. And so my body and mind must jolt from my dreams and spend the next hour cleaning up a man who is too tired and too sick to hold up his own head. Yet somehow, in a moment so mysterious that it must be of God, I am filled with peace in the quiet of our house, throwing filthy bedding down the laundry chute. And she tells about one occasion when they were riding in the car, and she said, I in particular was struggling with our lot that morning, a fairly common struggle with me. And I asked Ian if he is often tempted to curse God that may have put me dangerously close to Job's wife. But Ian, who is to me like a tree planted by the streams of water, answered easily, no, because God has been nothing but good to me. And Larissa goes on to say, I, don't know, I didn't know contentment in my prosperity. Contentment then meant health and ease, not God. God has not given us an indication that Ian will be fully healed here, which means that we have needed to enlist ourselves in our suffering. We still pray for complete healing, but we also pray for strength to endure a lifelong disability. We are learning that contentment is produced as we obey and act on his promises, like the one mentioned above, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Ian has been the best at teaching me this, even though we are given mercy to grow in contentment here, ultimately, we're built for heaven. On mornings when I wish I would just wake up without a brain injury, on mornings when I wish we could just wake up without a brain injury after saying, you and me both, sister, he points me to heaven that is so near, and coming from a man who can't sit up in bed on his own, but who does not even want to curse God, I will humbly follow his direction. I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Oh Father, first of all, this morning we just want to say thank you for all that we just read a few moments ago about what you've done for us when we were dead in our sins, when we were running and far from you and not even looking at you but just 
following everything that our minds and our hearts wanted. Lord, we thank you that you didn't just stay in heaven together with your son, but you sent him to this earth to seek us and to save us when we were lost. And then you gave your life and you died in our place so that so that we could live and so that we could know you. And oh Lord, I know in my own heart uh, sometimes the reason when the reasons why I'm discontent with things is because I value you so little. And Lord, as we just think about uh, this couple that has, has lost so much, but yet when they're so weak and so hurt, they have found this immeasurable strength in you. And Father, I know that uh, there are a lot of people who are hurting who are hearing my voice right now and Lord there are a lot of people who have uh, long paths that they still have to walk and Lord I pray this morning that Lord that they would find in you the same strength that that the Apostle Paul found when he was in prison the same grace that he found when he was asking you to take away the thing that was giving him pain. The same power and the same peace that Ian and Larissa Murphy find day by day in their relationship with each other and in their relationship with you. And Lord, may we just, for lack of a better word, Lord, may we just feast on who you are and just dig deep and to, and to really see and consider all the things that you've done for us and, and all the things that you continue to do for us and, and how you want to be so present in our lives. And Lord, as we do so, may we just receive such a strength and such a sufficiency and such a power that we're not even just thinking about wanting anything else because we're so overwhelmingly thankful for what we have. I pray this in Jesus' name.